this week on Intrigued Full Effect. They killed him. Never been to a show or been on a plane or been outside the city other than driving with us taking him place this. So many things he never had the chance to experience. Mm -hmm. Marty was loved by this family so much. This broke many of our hearts. I'm Shandrea Thomas, and welcome to episode two. In this podcast, we talk about curious cases, disappearances, and other stuff. And today we're talking about the 2017 disappearance and murder of 22-year-old Marty McMillan from Washington, D.C. We spoke to his grandmother and a local advocate and investigator who actually helped the family in the case. And I'm also joined by a special guest today. My husband, Jerron, wanted to stop by and add his insight to this story as well. Hey, what's up, people? So what was it about the story that you thought was so interesting? I was really interested in the online aspects of this case. I think that people take the Internet for granted, and there's really a lot of danger out there. It gives people kind of a false sense of security, and they don't realize other things can happen. They can go bad. Yeah, and for, unfortunately for Marty, that is exactly what happened. And his grandmother wants his story to serve as a cautionary tale for people who are planning to use online dating in the future to really stop and think about where they're meeting up with people and other things like that. So let's go ahead and get into the story. This is what happened. On April 22, 2017, Marty McMillan told his family he was heading to a date with a woman he met online. Later that night, he drove the new car his grandmother bought him to the 2600 block of Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue in Southeast D.C. to the woman's apartment. When the family didn't hear from Marty over the next few days, they knew something was wrong. Marty had vanished and instantly became a missing persons case. But that turned into a homicide after Marty's remains were found wrapped in a blanket by United States Park Police six months later along Suitland Parkway in Prince George's County. He was allegedly shot and killed by the woman's live-in boyfriend. Marty's grandmother, Felicia Cook, has been very vocal about her grandson's case and wants to make sure her voice is heard. First thing I want to say is I want to offer my condolences to you and your family because I know it's been a, a rough year plus for you guys. So I just wanted to make sure I told you that because I know you've had a lot that's happened in your life since then and things that you would never have imagined, I'm sure. Right. Yeah. That's so tell me, what what happened? Just tell me what happened. Well, Marty, um, that particular day, I was working a temp job. He had worked, and it was on a Saturday, he had worked that day. He had just started a friendship job with uh, the Selector Company and really excited about his new opportunity. Marty was staying with his grandmother at the time, who spoke to him the day before he disappeared. She said she just wanted to catch up with him, to hear his voice, but she had no idea that that conversation would be the last time she would ever speak to her grandson. I said, well, what are you going to do later? And he says, well... I'm probably just going to go see this little girl later on or something like that. And I said, well, Marty, that's good. I said, I can't say anything's wrong with that. You worked all day. You've been doing real good. So, you know, if you want to go out and have a little time, good time, Grandma and Stan. I said, I haven't seen you, but I just want to holler at you for a minute, see how things are going. And uh, I'll see you tonight um, when I get home. If I don't see you tonight, I'll see you in the morning. And he said, okay, Grandma, I'll talk with you later. I said, okay, Marty. Then I said to him, you know, I said, I'm so proud of you. I said, Marty, I just want you to know that. And he kind of chuckled, you know. And I said, okay, well, I'll see you later. See you later. That was the last phone call I had with my grandson. Um, came that Sunday. Didn't hear anything from him. And that Monday, it began to rain real hard. And I said, wow. You know, do do they work in the rain? I said, you know, he hasn't come home. I said, well, he probably is over his dad, you know. I said uh, something. Then I got to thinking, well, maybe I spent the night with the girl, you know, or anything. And then that Tuesday came and nothing is still pouring down rain. And I mean, it rained so hard, you call it see the drive. And uh, finally that Wednesday, you know, I got a little disturbed. I called and left a message. Later that day, Felicia called Marty's father, who said the last time he heard from Marty was before his date. She also checked his job, and Marty was nowhere to be found. 
His father said to me, look, I think something, that's what he calls me. He said, Felicia, I think something ain't, something is wrong. I said, why do you say that? I said, well, let me call uh, to the job and stuff. He said, I'm going to call the police. That's when family members went to police for help. My daughter, she drove up here and he and her, uh, she and his father went to the police precinct to check on had they heard anything or, you know, what they think. And they started telling his father and her that because Marty was 21 years old, 22 years old, that it's 30 days before they actually filed a missing person. 30 and, days? Um, yeah, that's what they were telling him. And they told him, yeah, but that's the laws and, um, because of the age, he's under 20, he's over 21, he is adult, so therefore that's how it goes. And the father begins to cry. Um, my daughter said he just kind of almost fainted and started crying. And he looks up at the officer, he said, what if it was your son? Man, you talk about my son here. And uh, a detective was standing there around in the area, kind of heard them, and came over to where they were and said, I am retiring, but, you know, I am a detective. I've been on the force this amount of years. I heard y'all cry out. I will try to work with you all to see what I can find out, what I can do. At that point, Marty's family started their own investigation. They got clues from his phone records and his Facebook page. And as a result, they found his car within about three weeks. And also, according to the family and media reports in D.C., Marty was using the website Plenty of Fish to meet women online. My daughter had his laptop, and she was going through his Facebook page, and she was reaching out to everybody out there that he knew. And granted, he knew 4,000 people. Mm. He knew 4,000 people. And um, she was going through every last one of them, especially in this area, Ask him, had you heard from him? Had you seen him? Have you talked to him or whatever? And then somehow she found out about plenty of fish. I guess it was on his laptop. Whatever. She began to see that. She got into that account. Um, I don't know how she got. She got into his account. And when she went into his account, that's when she started seeing women that he had met or girls that he had met on plenty of fish. And she started investigating that. And there we could see his text and his last phone calls. Where his last text had gone to uh, this person. We didn't know who it was at the time. We didn't know who this person was. And uh, I don't think the name was right or something. But there was a conversation on that day that he went on, like on that Sunday or the Saturday. Uh, it was a conversation on there. She started tracking that. And... Um, she tracked it. We found out that's the long last phone call or person that he had text. When it comes to plenty of fish, um, did they ever reach out to you? Did you ever have any contact with them after all this stuff went public? No, we couldn't even get any information from them trying to find out what they had, what they saw in reference to him communicating with this girl. They wouldn't even give us their privacy and all that stuff they were talking about. and They wouldn't give us anything, and not, nor did they call us back or communicate with us. We reached out to Plenty of Fish twice for a statement, but never got a response. With all that's uh, happened, what are some of your thoughts on just the dangers of the Internet? You never know who you're meeting out there. You never know what their story really is or what type of people they are. You know, that profile could be anyone. And Marty went out on a date of somebody he met on Plenty of Fish, and he ended up dead, killed, murdered. Um, and if he hadn't have gone there to meet that person, you know, he would still be hoping to be today. I would suggest that parents monitor their children, talk to their children, and you can't really protect your children like you want to because they we give these kids phones and things now, and they could be talking to anybody, but they have programs and applications and things. I would buy those programs and have them put on their systems, on their phones. From what your knowledge is about the case, what happened that night to him? He set up a date with this girl and he went, he went to the house and things went bad or? Yeah, so what I'm hearing, Marty was calling and said, having a date or whatever. And I guess Marty was must have been in the bedroom with her or something. I don't know. But the, uh, the, the uh, boyfriend came home. 
which Marty thought it was a friend. That's what she had been telling on Facebook, that she had some roommates. But this was not a roommate. This was a guy she was seeing, an older gentleman that she'd been seeing for a long time. She has two children by. And I guess he came in and Marty tried to hide. Marty was hiding in the closet. And he shot and killed Marty in the closet. Where does the case stand now? Well, we're going back and forth to hearings now. The person that was driving his car, uh, that person that was driving his car has not been charged. I've been fighting for that because he was driving a stolen car, not on a stolen car, but a murder person's car. And he has not been charged. We had to fight to get the young lady that invited him over there, knew what happened, saw everything. She is still on the street on her own recognizes. The gentleman that shot him seven times, uh, that gentleman, is he has been charged, but he hasn't been convicted with Marty's murder. In the apartment, they found guns and drugs, so he has been convicted with those charges so far. How did you guys come to the realization that he was not coming back? Um, I had felt that way actually within a week but my daughter and his father they still had hope they still was hoping that maybe we would find him somewhere um but i just knew i just knew because i knew my grandson's behavior i know how he is and uh i knew that you know if he wasn't communicating with us it's because he couldn't we caught up with local D.C. activist and investigator Henderson Long, who helped Marty's family search for answers. We asked why he got involved with missing persons cases, and he said first his niece went missing. She was found. Then his aunt Aileen disappeared in 1999 and hasn't been seen since. Well, I actually got involved when um, um, a relative of mine who was very young, a uh, juvenile, went missing in D.C., and I got involved. I realized how um how difficult it is for the Metropolitan Police Department to track and locate um missing persons. And I saw they didn't have enough resources and I really got got involved that way through trying to find her. Marty's case hurt so bad from the very beginning. It was a lesson, another bitter lesson for the community, for law enforcement, for advocates. In the very beginning, Marty was sort of was disenfranchised and he was kind of like you know he had a little record he ain't nothing big marty wasn't a bad guy no thug enough he just had stuff that normal young guys normally get into as they're growing up and coming into a man but in the very beginning really they, they didn't take his case serious um as investigators we learned to listen to that mom when the mom come in and she hollering and screaming telling you that she knows something wrong and her son is no longer with us, they batting 10 for 10. Well, MPD in the beginning, the Metropolitan Police Department, they said, oh, he a young guy, he just got a new car, he around here, he partying, he may have got him a little this or that and doing his thing. They really didn't take it serious. I think for about a month and a half, they didn't take it serious. But as more information became available, they really knew that Marty was in trouble and the case hurt me a lot because Marty had just got a new car. He was in a apprenticeship program. He was on his way. Marty, shoot, Marty was on his way up. He he was very good. I mean, he was in a, a really good um, trade, meaning he was going to be an electrician. Marty probably would have been a master electrician. Henderson has been involved in over 200 cases in the last four years. The mother cracked case wide open with mama. Marty's mother had found all this stuff on his computer and gave it to them. Um, and I'm going to tell you, they learned from it. They have admitted openly. I see a big difference with them, the police department, in terms of how they handle cases. But it was one of those bitter lessons that it's just, it's nasty. It's nasty taste in your mouth um, that we, can, we, can't, we can't do better. We need to do better. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, that's just how I feel. Marty's case is one of the worst right now. It is the worst one because he's a homicide now. He was killed. It was through their advocacy and working with us is what got Marty 
his case was big in D.C. The grandmother made so much stink in D.C. They had to do something. They had to get them people. They had to charge them. And I tell everybody, you got a homicide or a missing person, raise Cain. According to court documents, police have officially charged 40-year-old John McRae with second-degree murder while armed. As for 21-year-old Shania Davis, she was indicted on three counts of accessory after the fact. There was also a second man who was allegedly involved, but so far no charges have been filed. What would you say to the people who are responsible for Marty's death? To do something as cruel and heinous to take a person's life. Give your life. You took his life. He didn't have a chance to have a life because you took his life. Then give your life. Do the rest of your time, I am fighting for the rest of your life till you be behind bars. Okay. How do you think that you should have a life and go on with your life after so brutally killing and taking someone else's life? I'm going to fight for that to change. I want to fight for you to do the rest of your life behind bars. Felicia says she's redirecting her pain and she's using it to help other families fight for justice. It has taken so much from us. That's why I started to stand up to have this march that we're having on April 27, 2019. What exactly is the march about and what what is your end goal for all of that? Uh, we are marching um, sex trafficking has joined us already, I mean, to um, CPS, some people from CPS, and murders are hosting it because we are trying to stand up against the attorney generals and the laws that they have rented that's causing the hindrance and people getting answers and detectives doing a lot of things that they could do that they can't do because of law changes. And we're trying to present to them that the laws need to be stiffer. They need to give the detectives and things more lens to be able to go after somebody, not just anybody, but somebody they really suspect is suspicious of committing murder. And what about the um, the reporting of missing persons cases and things like that? Is there any adjustments that you guys want to have made to that? Yes, they need to, you know, instead of, well, one of them they did with Captain Dickinson, and she said at Marty's uh, rally, the first one, that she was, the law was changed now. If your child doesn't come home, unusual behavior in five minutes, you don't have to wait 24 hours to call and report them missing. And uh, what we're trying to get is the age to change. What do you want people to know about your grandson and what he meant to you and your family, what he still means to all of you? Right. I have been devastated. I haven't been myself. I'm very non-functional to a certain extent as far as cleaning the house, taking care of yourself, your hair. All my whole life has been destroyed. That's how I feel. My grandson was my heart love of my life. Um, that baby was like a purpose in my life. And when he was murdered with the time I had was so long that he stayed out of trouble get his life together. I am the one that has always been in this corner, courtrooms, jails. You know, our grandma has been every step of the way. And to finally see my prayer be answered, to see him sit down at the table with me and tears roll down his eyes. And he looks at me and say, Grandma, I have messed my life up. And I say to him, no, Marty, no, there is life after mess up baby. And all you got to do is to work to get yourself together and your life can change for the better and forever. And to think that that's what he began to accept that grandma was saying and began to see a little light and then someone kills him that way. He was doing nothing wrong. I mean, many times we throw a party out there with the wrong people. Anything could happen. But this time, Marty was trying to do what was right. He had a change of heart. And for me to give him that type of hope, and for him to end up that way, I always think, what was he thinking when this happened to him? Mm -hmm. My grandmother said, only way I was going was up. This, I ended up dying this way. You know, and doing the right thing, 
what he could have been feeling and thinking. Do you have any words of wisdom for other families who may be put in your situation in the future, unfortunately? Yes, I do. We cannot sit around and wait for the detectives and the police to do everything. We had to be investigators for our own grants, for my own grants. We had to do the investigation. We understand that family suffers behind this. Um, this is the most painful thing that anybody in this world could ever want to experience. Lives are the most important thing that God has given us all, the gift of life. And when that is taken, don't treat it with minimal concern. Understand that person is gone forever. I will never hear my grandson's voice again, see his smile again, or experience anything. He is gone forever. We would like to thank Felicia Cook for taking the time to talk with us about her grandson. It was a very difficult and emotional interview for her. And we just want to uh, say that we appreciate her taking the time because um, it takes a lot to, you know, have those conversations. Well, Jerome, my final thoughts about this case are that, number one, people should take more precautions, especially when they're dealing with online dating, online connections and things like that, because things can happen to you. Things can go bad, whether you're a male or a female. Uh, yeah, and I don't think it's just particularly with the online dating sites. I think this gets back to the false sense of security I was talking about. Uh, people post so much stuff on these social media accounts. If I'm bad guy A, you've given me a good idea of how you live, how many people are in your house, and really a real-time shot of what you're doing and where you're at. If I want to do harm to you, that's a real good source of information. Yeah, so especially the, those, you know, parts where people say, I'm checking in here, I'm going here, I'm going there. People know where you are, when you got there, and all of that. So that's a good good way to think about things. The other thing that I found interesting about the case was that the police actually changed how they handle missing persons cases. Because before, I was told that certain cases were selected to be tweeted and to have releases put out. But they've actually changed all of that now. So all the missing persons cases are tweeted all of them have releases put out, and they actually have a website to go along with it. Yeah, what I like about that is that also kind of eliminates the sense of bias when, you know, from the public. Yeah, especially when it comes to selecting certain cases and things like that. I mean, you, at least everyone, it's an, it's an even playing field when it comes to every single person, unfortunately, who, you know, turns up missing. Yeah, so I agree with that as well. And the last thing that I think stands out for me is that Marty's grandmother, um, pretty much took her anguish and the tragedy in her life and she wants to help other people so they're having this march coming up later on this year and the goal is to change laws to give police more leeway when it comes to investigations they also want to change amber alert the age age range for it so they can add more people to the amber alert system so i think that's kind of interesting yeah that's some uh, good stuff i hope it all works out for them yeah i hope so too you will be hearing more from Henderson Long because he is involved with a lot of missing persons cases out of D.C. with helping families, including missing nine-year-old Relisha Rudd. So I do plan on talking about that case in the future, along with other cases that he will be bringing to me. So just be on the lookout for that. I am planning to blog about this episode. And another thing is, if you do want me to check out a case, just reach out to me on the Intrigued Full Effect website or via email at intriguedfulleffect at hotmail.com. Again, I'll say it, intriguedfulleffect at hotmail.com. All right, Jerron, thank you for joining me for this episode. You think you'll come back? Oh, yeah, thank you for having me. I just uh, hope I didn't make you look too bad here. No, I don't think so. I guess it's time to go have dinner. Let's do it. <laughs> Until next time, be safe and stay true. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Intrigued Full Effect, Curious Cases, Disappearances, and Other Stuff podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the host. The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. 
The host of this podcast assumes no liability or responsibility for any activities and connections with opinions shared in the podcast. The podcast and blog associated with it shall not be used in any legal capacity or as a basis for expert testimony. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on the podcast or blog. This podcast uses copyrighted materials that were fully authorized by the owner. Music provided by Pond5.